Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Uh, it's a privilege to be here this morning. What Simon and I are going to do for the next 40 minutes or so is just give you all a little bit of an update on vascular access and some of the innovations that are going on in vascular access. I'm rather hopeful that nothing will come as a huge surprise or shock to you, but I think there are a few things that we've been up to over the last few years here in Oxford and been involved with internationally, as well as some of the trials that we're bringing in here that are quite interesting, stimulating, and I hope will spark a bit of discussion towards the end. Here are my disclosures as we start out. So just by way of a bit of introduction, really, for those of you that don't know, the reality across the UK at the moment, more and more people are going on to dialysis each year. If you look at the most recent renal registry report, at the end of 2014, we had 115 patients per million population that started on dialysis. And at the moment, there's a prevalence of around about 920 per million population on dialysis, one of the highest incidents across Europe. We at present have about 25,000 patients on just hemodialysis alone. And what's interesting, the last 10 odd years, the cause of renal failure leading to end stage and needing dialysis has dramatically changed, with diabetes being the single most common cause of end stage kidney disease. Hemodialysis still seems to be the biggest renal replacement therapy modality, followed by transplantation and then peritoneal dialysis. And we know that these figures are going to rise year on year, and so access for our patients is an essential requirement of their care. But dialysis is really bad for you. Yeah. We look at these figures long term. If you end up on dialysis and look at your life survival, it's pretty bleak. And if you then look at the underlying cause of your kidney failure, your survival can be even worse if you end up having diabetes. Five years survival on dialysis as a diabetic is probably worse than kind of many of the cancer outcomes at the moment. So it's bleak for these patients. In terms of the Oxford Kidney Unit, we serve six counties and the patients across those six counties for dialysis care. And that covers around about a 3 million population. And at present, we've got around about 909 patients on dialysis across those six counties. So pretty high numbers per million population for us compared to the national figures. We have 751 at the moment on hemodialysis, and that represents 82% of all of our patients on dialysis. And across the six counties, we've now got 11 dialysis units providing dialysis care for our patients six days a week, with increasing efforts to get more and more patients on home therapies with people being taught to needle themselves and do home, di home hemodialysis. This is the breakdown of our hemodialysis program. There are some big national incentives, both financially um, and also in terms of recommendations from best practice, that wants to see us with a prevalence of around about 80% of our patients dialysing on a fistula or a graft. This is the breakdown of our figures here in Oxford, which we're pretty proud of. We're just shy of that 80%. With not too many people currently on dialysis on a long-term line. So what do we do? Many of you will know this. Quite a lot of our access work is around creating simple fistula, utilising the cephalic vein in the forearm or upper arm to make a radial or break a cephalic. And there are around about two to 300 of these done a year through this organisation. Once you start utilising your cephalic veins, we then move in to get the basilic vein fully dissected out and then moved up into a superficial position on the arm so it can be easily accessed for kneeling purposes for dialysis. The basilic vein lies pretty deep on the inside of your arm, so doing that for four hours is pretty uncomfortable. It's also difficult getting needles into dialysis. You've got nerves running over the basilic vein, hence this rather large incision to move the vein onto the top. We're now starting to make this more minimally um, invasive with videoscopic utilisation of the vein and um, minimal incision surgery. Once you've utilised your vein options, you then start needing prosthetic material, biological or plastic grafts. And the principles of putting any graft in for dialysis is having a good inflow, an artery somewhere, supplied by a fairly good working pump, i.e. good heart function, and then an outflow somewhere, a vein that you can join onto so that the graft provides a conduit between your artery and your vein for dialysis purposes. And wherever you've got an inflow and an outflow, you can join the two. Conventionally, we may use a forearm loop configuration, an upper arm straight configuration, or may move down to the legs if those um, upper arm options have gone. And of course, what we're aspiring to for all of our patients is happy patients on dialysis who can clock onto their dialysis sessions three times a week, 
get needled, have really good speeds going through their needles as we're dialyzing them, process good amounts of fluid to take off the fluid that they're, that they're accumulating between dialysis sessions, and overall getting good dialysis adequacy. But when you come to access for any forms, whether it's a pacemaker, a port -a cath for nutrition, a PIC line for antibiotic therapy, perm cath for dialysis, or a fistula, we know that the holy grail for these patients to have a good access outcome is the patency of their central vasculature. You need to know that their central veins from the level of the subclavians back into the atrium are patent so that you can place your access or your access is going to run and run effectively back into the atrium. But of course, many of our access patients, whether it's a port getting infected, lines getting infected, fistulas blowing out, do this over the course of time, and patients progressively use up their vascular access real estate. If you look at a kind of classic, typical renal replacement therapy patient journey, they'll end up having a history where they may have a couple of lines, they may have a few fistulas created, they may get some grafts. In between all that lot, they may get a few transplants that sees them off dialysis for a while. And as they use up their real estate, they become an increasing access challenge, especially if they start to develop central vein pathology and have what we would term end-stage vascular access, where you've used up all of your conventional access roots, veins, graft placements, but now you start to have the presence of central vein stenosis, central vein pathology. And we know when we look at the literature and the experience, that the stenoses that develop centrally are all exclusively related to having a centrally placed device, whether it's a line for a short period of time, a long time, or even a pacemaker or any other device that goes in, the instance of central vein stenosis starts to rise. You can see here, this is the dialysis catheter, it's only been in for about four months. Already you've got a critical stenosis in your SVC leading down to the atrium, which will affect any access you try and create for that patient in the future. These are the sorts of patients I get to see a lot more of, critical stenosis centrally or a complete obliteration and loss of their central vasculature. When we conventionally undertake venograms, CT venograms of these patients, and this is the sort of thing you see, and then someone comes to you and says, we can't get a line in but we need access for nutrition, drugs, et cetera, et cetera. So they become a real challenge to us. And if you do try and make fistulas for these patients, they run into significant morbidity with venous hypertension because particularly if it's a fistula, four lanes of motorway traffic coming from your artery up your fistula vein or your graft hitting a complete occlusion centrally and it has nowhere to drain so it backs up in the arm. So what can we do for these patients? Well, we could leave them on a line wherever we can place one, or we can consider what I would call a heroic intervention. And by that, I'm kind of meaning any procedure that's looking to try and treat or bypass that central stenosis to enable either your fistula or your graft to run normally, straight back to the atrium, place a line and have a line in for, for access purposes, uh, and treat any underlying venous hypertension. I'm not going to go into a lot of the literature around each of those areas, but just to say kind of the problem with lines, we know they cause infections. We see an increasing amount of this, potentially life-ending thrombus sitting at the end of a line tip there. And of course, we know that they cause stenosis. And if you look at the literature, it's quite chilling when you read through it, just the number of catheters, even for a short period of time, that will end up having catheter occlusion secondary to thrombus, and over time, the catheter being lost because of thrombus. And if you get thrombus on your catheter, whether it's just a sheath around the outside, a little bit of clot within the line itself, clot between the tip of the catheter or the wall, or right on the tip of the catheter itself, so that when you take it out, you get this sort of appearance. The more you have that happen, the more likely you are to end up with central vein pathology and stenosis, not to mention some of the problems that occur with increasing risks of infection and pulmonary embolus from these sorts of things. Again, if you trawl through the literature, the more lines you have, the more likely you are to develop a stenosis, and the longer that line is in for, the more likely you are to get a stenosis. We know that if you put lines in subclavians and on the left-hand side, the instance of getting a stenosis very quickly is very, very high. Hence the tendency to always want to try and go for a right internal jugular as the first access portal, not to mention it's slightly easier to cannulate. And longer term, when you look at outcomes for patients, if you leave people on lines, particularly in a dialysis population, they fare less well, have higher mortality risk compared to if they're dialyzing off fistulas or grafts. And there's similar literature now coming out for other access patients, pick lines, port caths for nutrition purposes, that they have increasing morbidity and mortality related to the presence of lines centrally. So in terms of heroic options we could do for these patients, we could use their lower limbs, and we do put a reasonable number of lower limb grafts into patients. But of course, with an increasing population of diabetics, 
Quite a lot of them come to us with peripheral vascular disease, and you put a graft into their leg for dialysis purposes, and they can run into some significant problems with steel syndrome, thromboembolic phenomena, limb loss potentially. So there has to be some careful consideration about going to the legs. When you do go to the legs, though, because the veins and arteries are of good calibre, you can usually get some very good outcomes with your dialysis axis down in the leg. My radiologists enjoy putting stents up and plastering central stenosis and do get some very good radiological results. But the increasing literature now shows that over the course of time, you don't get great outcomes in terms of primary and primary assisted patency on these stents sitting centrally. And the more stents you start putting in your subclavians and in your SVCs, the more challenging it becomes to get access in the future if those stents fracture, thrombose, migrate, etc. So that brings me to the hemodialysis reliable outflow graft, also known as the HERO graft. It is a treatment option for patients with end-stage vascular access, and it's the only option on the market that's a fully subcutaneous arteriovenous access option that offers long-term access for patients with central vein stenosis. We can use it for patients who've got a failing fistula or graft because they've got central problems and they're developing venous hypertension because there's nowhere for the access to drain. One of the unique properties of the HERO graft is this central stent component. It is a six millimeter diameter, outer diameter, nitinol based siliconized stent that's very durable, more durable than most stents that get put in radiologically. Because it's siliconized, you don't get any ingrowth, any incorporation of the stent, so you can take it out at any point you want, you can put it back in. And of course, because you're not having to join it onto a vein, say up in an, in an axilla for a conventional graft, you get very good outcomes because it's sitting centrally in the atrium. And then it connects onto a standard graft for dialysis purposes using this unique central titanium connector. So what you have here is a diagrammatic picture of hero graft. You can see this stent graft sitting centrally through a stenosis in the atrium. And then it's tunneled subcutaneously and connects onto your standard PTFE graft via this titanium connector. You can take the HERO outflow, cut its graft component short, connect it onto a fissure that's already there to decompress venous hypertension and shunt all that blood back centrally, or a graft. This is just a little video animation showing what generally happens with the HERO purposes. You've got your patient with central stenosis, and the key thing you need to do is get access into that atrium, so it's an ultrasound guided puncture of whatever vein you can find in the neck, and you get a wire down through your stenosis into the atrium. Invariably, we have to do a plasty to get it up to about eight millimeter diameter to take the peel away sheath and then this outflow stent graft, which we then get down sitting into the atrium. At that point, we'll then tunnel this stent from its puncture point subcutaneously out to the clavipectoral groove, where we've made a little small incision to receive the graft. And then at that point, you'll tunnel a conventional dialysis graft down to whichever artery you're gonna use for your inflow. So there's the brachial artery down to the antecubital fossa. The dialysis graft, the PTFE components, and then the stent graft in the atrium get connected via this connector. And you do your arterial anastomosis as standard. And now you have an arterial venous device that's shunting straight from an artery into the atrium, bypassing a central stenosis, central vein occlusion. And you can then get on and dialyze your patients, needle your graft as normal. Americans have put about 10,000 of these in now, and that's because they set themselves up very badly in the States. It's money-driven. A lot of their patients start out on a perm cath and have multiple central lines, and then they try and create fistulas, and none of them work because they've got debilitating central vein pathology. So they've put lots of these hero graphs in since it had um, FDA approval back in about 2002. And this is some of the early literature that came out from the big series of about 50 to 100 in each of these publications. And one of the interesting things here, which I considered before we started using HERO, was this figure. Pretty high bacteremia rates. And what was happening is that because the PTFE component of the HERO is a standard graft and you can't needle it for a couple of weeks because it has to incorporate in the tissues, they were leaving their patients with a bridging perm cath still in situ, either alongside the HERO device or in the groin. But then these patients would disappear, never return for their follow-up, and suddenly six, seven months later they turn up with a HERO and a graft that's now infected because the line's got infected. So they had to take some of their heroes out. So this is a big learning point when we looked at the literature before we considered. We went live doing hero graft back in 2013. We did the UK's first implantation and Europe's second implantation in July of that year. We've done 26 implantations to date, which is by far the biggest series in Europe at present. 
23 of those implants have gone into renal patients for dialysis purposes, but three have gone into intestinal failure patients for access, which I'll come on to shortly. I mentioned that the arterial graft component that comes with HERO, the PTFE component, needs two weeks to incorporate before you can needle it. So what I've always done in these cases is I've cut that graft short, as I showed you in the rescue picture for a standard graft, and then I've put uh, an early cannulation graft, a quick stick graft, onto it with an anastomosis that enables our patients to dialyze the minute they end up in recovery off this graft. The quick stick grafts are novel grafts that we've had for about four years now here. Um, they have their trilaminate grafts, so they have a middle elastomer layer that's usually foam or gel based. When you draw your needle out, it self seals and closes so you don't get such huge amounts of bleeding from the graft puncture site. We've rescued a number of fistulas and grafts, eight cases, with the HERO, and we had one patient on a bridging catheter. The hardest part of HERO is the planning. Every patient gets CT venograms and conventional venograms to plan your entry into the atrium. If you've got central vein pathology, you're usually going via some sort of collateral, so you need to know how you're going to get down into the atrium. I've always done this in combination with my radiology colleagues, and I'm thankful to Phil Bourbon and Ross Tapping for their contributions to making this program work. We've got a mixture of left and right sided implantations and we've done one in the groin. We had one case where the SVC was completely occluded and so we did a sharp recanalization here with cardiothoracics on standby. You can imagine wires from the groin and wires from the neck coring through your atrium through a stenosis to open it up and then get the outflow down. It does have potential risks associated with it. But all the others have needed some on-table plasty of that pathology to enable the inner outflow component to go down. Here's the kind of classic venograms you see beforehand. Looks okay on the right side coming in here, but then when you look on the left side, you see that the left innominate's completely gone, and actually the IJs have gone. So just above the clavicle here, you can get using a micropuncture needle straight into the top of this innominate, and then get down into the atrium. And here we can see getting a little cannula in, getting a wire down, peel away sheath in, and then advancing that outflow component of the herograft until it's in place to connect onto the outflow component. More cases, occlusions. This is the one we sharp recanalize. As I said, wires from above and below to open things up, stretch it up, and then get your outflow component down. I see more and more of these patients. They've had stents in. You can probably see a stent here in the right innominate behind the clavicle. It's thrombosed, it's fractured, and it's migrated. The internal jugulars have gone on this side. This is an external jugular collateral. And then, of course, more and more renal patients get a pacemaker put in. But they have a fistula created. Uh, my cardiology colleagues very kindly put a pacemaker in on the side of their axis, and then they develop a stenosis around the pacing wires. And then they get venous hypertension. So you can see the fistula draining up the arm here. Pointer's not working. <coughs> venous hypertension developing. And so what we do in these cases is plasty around those pacing wires, get an outflow component down, and then decompress that venous hypertension. This particular here has been running for three years now. Patient with a ginormous head because her fistula from her right arm was going around her head first before it came back down the left side and in. Put a here in on that left side, necklace it across and decompress the fistula on the right hand side and this has kept this woman going for about a year before she passed away. As I said, it's a combined approach in theatres, planning how we're going to get in, getting that wire down, needing to do the plasty, getting the outflow down and then tunnelling it out here to the clavipectoral area. I mentioned that we have to do this additional anastomosis, there's a little counter incision just at the top of the arm to enable this early cannulation graft which is tunnelled down the arm here to be stuck the next morning onto the standard bit of PTFE that comes with the connector onto the HERO component. And this is what some of our patients look like. You can see the outflow component sitting subcutaneously there and a long needleable segment for dialysis. We've got about 18 of those 26 patients that have gone beyond a year and there are about six or seven patients now beyond two years and a couple up to three years with a HERO graft. I alluded to you that if you're on dialysis, your outcome is pretty bad long term. So it's no surprise that patients die with grafts uh, you take it personally, but actually you realise this is what happens to this cohort of patients. But we had five patients that died with a functioning graft in the first year, three are renal, two are intestinal failure. Six of these 18 patients have needed 16 interventions to maintain patency. This is really encouraging. Cumulative death centre patency, pretty high, 85% at one year. And no bacteremias at all in any of our patients in that year. 
we had one needle site infection that settled with antibiotics. So I showed you this data early on. We put in our early data. I think it's pretty encouraging. Yes, the numbers are smaller compared to some of the Americans, but we clearly thought about this well. We've put this in carefully. We've considered all the things that can go wrong with these patients. And at the moment, we're getting comparable outcomes in terms of patency, intervention rates, with the HERA series that have been published so far. And then, of course, when you look at standard graph literature, we can see that patency longer term, keeping these people on dialysis, is far superior to a standard graft. Something I've been involved with the last couple of years, I mentioned to you that we have to anastomose an early cannulation graft onto the HERO component. We've been working on this super HERO adapter, I love the nomenclature. This um, new unique adapter enables us to connect onto the outflow, but we can put a particular graft of our choice straight onto that adapter without having to do the anastomosis. And we got a CE license last month, and we put Europe's first case of this in just recently. I mentioned we had three intestinal failure patients that got HERO. These were patients that turned up with severe central vein stenosis after years of lines, TPN. A couple of patients were post-bowel transplant and were running into difficulties with their bowel transplant, and one was pre. They had no peripheral vasculature to speak of and we're all needing PN and a whole host of other infusions. And so we thought, you know, HERO graft placement could be unique and novel for these patients. Give them an arteriovenous device that's got a big surface area for needling. I spent some time working with the hematology oncology guys looking at what they use for needles for giving chemotherapy. And we found these lovely closed cannula systems that plastic cannulas so you haven't got sharp needles sitting in your PTFE. And we were able to cannulate these PTFE grafts, leave these cannulas in for up to about 36 hours, giving TPN down the, fist, down the graft for that period of time, and rotating the cannulas around the PTFE every 36 hours. One patient had TPN off her hero for about two months before getting a transplant. She's got three-year primary patency, and we still access this hero for her for taking blood, for giving fluids when she comes in. The other two patients, we had one who was end stage with bone marrow failure, sepsis, was on ITU, had no access options, but we were able to keep her going with her leg hero having inotropes, TPN, dialysis, antibiotics, all through about six cannulas in a hero device because she had no veins to, to, to cannulate. Which kind of brings you to the big question about AV fistulas and AV grafts for non-dialysis patients. There's always this mantra that you just put a fistula in for someone who needs dialysis. No one should ever go near the fistula. It's sacred. No one should needle it. No one should put a tourniquet on that arm. Always be on the other side. The whole point about creating access for people is because they need access for something. And if you can't get a access into a vein in a different arm, there's a huge fistula there that you can use. It's easy for me to say that. Um, and do that, not so easy for others. But we know that in these patients who come in septic, moribund, you can't get access, the best thing to do is to cannulate a fistula or a graft. And we've done that in a number of our renal patients for a whole host of reasons, not just for their access. We've used fistulas and grafts for TPN with good results, with no infections. As I've mentioned, we've done it in the HERA patients. And we've got a whole host of non-renal patients coming to us now that need access. We've got intestinal failure patients, two now who've had fistulas created, have been taught to cannulate those fistulas themselves, and they're on home PN, needling their fistula each day and connecting up their PN. Some hemochromatosis patients need to be bloodlet every few months. It's very easy to bloodlet off an arteriovenous fistula compared to off a vein, and you can do it pretty quickly. So I think this is quite novel. It's something we're seeing more of. There's an increasing literature around this. So watch that space. I just come back to this now, these patients with central vein pathology who've got complete occlusions in their SVCs, and they're an access nightmare, and they need a line suddenly for infusions, for antibiotics, for nutrition, not just for dialysis purposes. Is there anything else we could do for them that's perhaps not quite so radical as a hero graft? This is the sort of thing we see. There are what I would call four classifications of central vein pathology. We see a lot of this where you've just got maybe one juggler occluded, so it's quite easy to cannulate on any of the other sides and put lines in. But this is what we're getting more and more of now, where you can't actually easily get into the SVC because everything around it's gone, or actually everything centrally has gone. If you think a little bit about your anatomy in the neck, and I'm sure you can remember this pretty well, there's this lovely area just above the clavicular, supraclavicular notch where there's absolutely nothing just above the notch apart from skin and fat, and then you come down onto the vein. We know behind the vein there's quite a lot of interesting 
anatomy that can get you into trouble. And we know that if we're constantly sticking needles from outside to inside, going from the outside world through the skin to this area, there is a chance that we're going to start hitting things that we shouldn't hit. When you also consider your anatomy from the level of the groin all the way up to the heart, when you look at your SVC and all the vessels around it, there's a straight line that runs all the way from the groin straight up into the heart and above it, particularly from the right groin. If you then have a little think about your vasculature, particularly your venous vasculature, looking from behind and from front, if you strip back the bones from behind, you can see that your SVC sits just behind the clavicular notch on this side, and when you look from the front as you take the bones out, it's sitting beautifully just there behind you, behind the clavicle. Thinking about your relationship to other structures, we know everything lies behind, and we know we've only got bones in front. So theoretically, why do we always miss when we puncture from outside going in if it's just sitting there? Well, if it's occluded, you can see why. So how about if we were to do something particularly different and we were to come from inside out? Let's say we're actually inside the vein. You're kind of thinking, well, it's occluded. How are we going to get into occlusion? But let's say we're inside the vein and we know there's nothing above the clavicular notch. Can we be inside and come straight out safely to then recanalize that? Well, yes, we can. This is some work I've been... Um, doing uh, of late, I've just finished some training around this in Maastricht the last couple of days using this surfacer device. It's an inside out technology that essentially enables you to get from inside an occluded vessel outside safely, recanalize and get a line in for your patients. So you have your patient, as I said, if you come from the right groin, you've got pretty good straight inline anatomy all the way to your jugular. And the idea of surfacer is that you're going to recanalize this occluded segment. So you get a guide wire up through the atrium, and there's a sheath that comes up. And then you advance the sheath carefully into this occlusion. This is a fibrous band. If you just go straight, you will come straight through it. And the important thing is to be above the level of the clavicle. There then is fluoroscopically a, a target window that you put on the outside in the supraclavicular notch. And you line these two up. And then you advance a little sharp needle wire. And it will come straight from inside to out through that area safely. And then, of course, you can put a peel-away sheath on your wire there, and you pull everything straight back through your stenosis into your atrium. It gives you the opportunity to then get lines back into these patients. And I think this may be a safe and novel approach for many of our patients who are needing access, whether it's a pacemaker, line for nutrition, line for dialysis. We've got debilitating central vein pathology. I've had the privilege of working with John Gurley, who's a cardiologist in the States, who's done 600 of these now. He's never used the surfacer kit, but has developed it. But what he's done for the, his 600 cases, he's gone down to the local hardware store, got a few bits of kit and sharpened his radiology wires to do this exact procedure. But Bluegrass and Merritt, who have been working with, have taken that whole concept of 600 safe recanalizations and converted it into this very useful piece of kit. There have been 30 canalizations across Europe now, and Oxford have just... Um, being given registry centre status for the UK. And so we'll be looking to do this here in this centre in the coming months ahead. So a quick whistle stop really of a few interesting innovations more for the complex access patient. We know that our end stage access patients are becoming increasingly more common. And we know that any history of central vein devices, whether it's a catheter, a pacemaker, will accelerate that end stage vascular access the herograph is a really good option for patients, particularly from a dialysis perspective, but of course you can use it in other patients who haven't got dialysis needs but have access needs. And we're seeing more and more that fissures and grafts have a role to play in patients who don't necessarily need dialysis but critically need access day after day for a whole host of things. And finally, I think the surface of device is going to give us a lot more in terms of options for our patients for being able to recanalize central vein occlusions and re-establish vascular access for them. I'm going to hand over to Simon now, unless there's any burning questions at this point. Right, thanks, James. Um, so, most of what James has spoken about so far is sort of one end of the spectrum. It's the sort of the very difficult patients that have had lots of failed access in the past and have got central vein pathology. Of course, most of what we do in vascular access surgery is to form fistulas in patients without much access history. And as James alluded to at the beginning of his talk, 
the preferred option is to use the patient's own veins for their access rather than any grafts or fancy devices. We know that native access using the patient's own veins have a lower risk of thrombosis and less risk of infection. And so um, that's our sort of gold standard, if you like, for first access. But they're not without difficulties. It's quite challenging to get successful access formed in a patient and then maintain successful access in a, in a patient for any period of time. Um, when we're talking about fistula patency, we can define it in three ways. So primary patency, essentially those fistulas that you've formed that have not had any difficulties, not required any intervention. Assisted patency are those fistulas that have worked, carried on working, but have needed some help to keep them going. So a venoplasty for a stenosis or a ligation of a branch or some banding or a treatment for steel syndrome. And then secondary patency are those fistulas that have thrombosed and required either a radiological or a surgical declotting. And these are some of our results from the last audit that we did of our access outcomes in Oxford. And you can see that even the best fistulas, the brachiocephalics, um, about a third of them require some kind of intervention or fail within the first year. And if you look at the radiocephalics, so the, the ones in the smaller vessels at the wrist, um, over half of them require some kind of intervention or fail within the first year after formation. So there's a real need for innovations and new techniques for forming fistulas and for trying to keep fistulas running um, in, these, in these difficult patients. Thinking about pathologies, well, James has already talked about the, the idea of needing good inflow and good outflow to form a, a decent access. A lot of our end-stage renal patients are also diabetic. The arteries are often diseased, and that makes the inflow problematic. James has talked a lot about the outflow and central venous stenosis. But when you form a fistula, you're creating something abnormal. You're putting arterial flow through a vein, and that causes pathological changes within the vein wall. And we see this process called near intermore hyperplasia. And essentially what happens is the arterial flow causes changes within the endothelium, and you get alterations in sort of pro-inflammatory markers. You get proliferation of smooth muscle, deposition of extracellular matrix, and that will lead to a gradual narrowing of your fistula vein, the consequence of which is that your fistula stops working quite as well, so you end up with problems with poor flows on dialysis, with recirculation through the dialysis machine, but you also um, eventually get to a critical stenosis which puts you at risk of a thrombosis, and the access will stop running and will fail. So what can we do? Um, so one of the new technologies which a lot of dialysis centres have started to, to buy into is this idea of far infrared therapy, and it's essentially it's, it's a, the love child of an angle poised lamp and a sauna, um, and it delivers electromagnetic energy at a wavelength of, of sort of in the far infrared spectrum, and there's been. Quite a lot of experimental work done looking at human um, endothelial cells, umbilical endothelial cells in culture. And if you deliver far infrared therapy to these cells, what you get is you get a reversal of some of these pathological changes that you see um, in a fistula that lead to near intimal hyperplasia. Um, and the effects are both thermal, so if you, if you simply heat the culture medium up, you see some changes, um, but also thermally independent effects. And you get an increase in nitric oxide production, which causes vasodilatation and improves the endothelial cell function. But you also get an increase in homoxygenase 1 activity, which is an anti-inflammatory effect, um, which reduces smooth muscle deposition, it reduces fibrosis, um, and has sort of beneficial effects in terms of endothelial cell function, which theoretically should reduce some of these changes that lead to the near intimal hyperplasia in the draining vein. And so a group in Taiwan have, have developed this device and tested it, um, and they've devised this clinical protocol whereby you essentially sit one of these fire infrared lamps above the fistula, above the needle site for your fistula, about 20, 30 centimetres above, above the fistula site, um, for 40 minutes during each dialysis session three times a week. Um, and they've done a few clinical trials, mainly in Taiwan, looking at the effects on fistula maturation and and the development of stenosis in fistulas. So the first study they did was a randomized controlled trial looking at um, de novo fistulas, so newly formed upper arm fistulas, brachiocephalic, radiocephalic fistulas, and they randomized just over 120 patients to far infrared treatment or standard care for 12 months. 
And what you can see on the bottom left-hand side is that the maturation rates were significantly higher in the far infrared treated patients. Um, so physiological maturation, which the left-hand bars is the sort of uh, definition is, is essentially a, a, a fistula of a, of a particular diameter with a certain flow in it. And then the clinical maturation is those fistulas that are actually usable for dialysis at 12 months um, on, on regular dialysis sessions. Um, and what they also showed was a higher unassisted patency. So a higher proportion of these fistulas required no intervention during their first 12 months. And very importantly, there were no adverse events. It was well tolerated by the patients that were treated. The second study they went on to do was to look at maintaining patients on dialysis on this treatment, so sort of prophylactic therapy to prevent the development of access complications. And again, they took stable patients who um, had been running off of a fistula for more than six months with no recent problems and randomized them to 12 months of far infrared therapy versus standard care. And the incidence of malfunction requiring intervention was just under half of that in, in the control arm with far infrared therapy. Um, they also reduced the intervention rates um, and demonstrated higher flows on dialysis in, in these patients. And the patency you can see in the graph at the bottom there was significantly improved over a 12-month period. The problem with these studies is they all come from a single centre. The people in that centre have a vested interest in this technology because they developed it. Um, and this has not really been tried outside of Taiwan, outside of the Taiwanese di dialysis population. Um, so we're not really certain in the UK whether this is feasible in our dialysis units, whether it will show the same level of effect, um, and indeed whether it's cost effective. Um, so we've set out to, to develop a trial to try and replicate these results in the UK and to see whether this really works. And it's quite important because actually a lot of dialysis units, including Oxford, are purchasing these machines. We've got two in Oxford. There are two in Reading already. Um, and the distributor tells me that they've sold about 60 or 70 of these devices in the UK in the last year. So the study we've developed is really looking at the use of fire infrared therapy in the NHS dialysis population to determine efficacy, to determine safety, but also to determine feasibility and cost effectiveness. Um, one of the things, I'll come back to that in a second. So the study design is essentially a, a two-arm randomized controlled trial comparing 12 months, uh, 24 months, sorry, of far infrared therapy versus standard care in patients with stable native dialysis access. Um, and outcome-wise, we're looking at unassisted patency um, at the 12-month point, but also at the 24-month point, <laughs> looking at fish dialysis adequacy, fistula flows. Um, quite importantly, if you talk to some of the patients that have had this treatment in our dialysis units, one of the big benefits for patients is that they say that it reduces the pain on needling, but it also reduces the pain that they experience through the vibration of the pump through the dialysis needles whilst they're on dialysis. And so that's one of the outcomes that, that we'd really like to capture in this trial, because it's sort of important from a patient perspective. Um, and then we'll work with Herc as well for a full health economic analysis. So we have enough centres on board to be able to recruit. We put an AEME application in at the end of last year. Um, unfortunately, they declined to fund it, but did leave the door open for us. That The main concern that they had is they wanted this study to be placebo controlled, um, which is quite challenging because the fire infrared device generates heat. Um, and creating a placebo device that doesn't generate heat is obviously going to be fairly obvious to the nurses and the patients, but if you treat the fistula with heat, um, then that may have some effects on, on flow and, and skin flow. So we have put in a development grant application to try and develop a placebo device that doesn't deliver heat and to test it on patients and see whether it works. So that's where we've got to with that one. That's really looking at fistulas and, and sort of maintaining fistulas once they're up and running and working. But one of the other challenges with access is actually getting a fistula working in the first place. And as you know, and as from James has already shown from pictures, we do this surgically. Um, so it involves opening the antecubital fossa or the risk, dissecting out the cephalic vein, and then anastomosing it onto the artery, as you see in the picture there. And what you get is this... Um, skeletonized lower section of vein, you lose all the perivascular tissue around it, which has some effect of the blood flow to that vein. Um, and there is a risk of wound complications, hematoma seromas in these patients. They're 
patients with end-stage renal failure, they're often diabetic, so they are prone to, to wound complications and problems. In an attempt to counter this, there's a company called TVA in Texas in the US that have developed um, an endovascular fistula creation system, um, which they've been trialing over the last year or so. Um, and the principle behind this is that you cannulate your brachial artery, you cannulate your brachial vein, you put guide wires down into the ulnar artery and its vena comitante in the forearm, and then you pass a catheter down either limb, and you essentially just burn a hole between the artery and the vena comitante in order to arterialize the deep venous system. And if you've got perforators um, that are patent, then that will arterialize the superficial venous system, and you'll end up with arterial flow through the superficial veins that you can then cannulate. So just to show sort of how that works on a on a, uh, an animation, so you put your guide wire in the brachial artery and the brachial vein, you pass your sheaths down and you pass your cannulas through the sheaths down into the ulnar vein and the ulnar artery. The catheters line up, there are markers that you can see radiologically and they sit side by side and they're magnetic so they rotate themselves and sit next to each other and then a little electrode comes out with a radio frequency uh, generator attached to the end of the catheter creates uh, a window of about five millimeters between the artery and the vein. And then you withdraw your catheters and the net result is you get arterial flow into the venous system which then passes into the superficial system. If you want to divert flow into the superficial venous system, you can also coil and embolize the, the brachial vein higher up in the arm. And that provides you with lots of needling points in both the cephalic and the basilic venous system. So these are the sort of images you get in the IR suite. So you pass your wire down the ulnar artery. Your catheter, you can see, has markers on it, which enable you to sort of line it up perfectly. The magnets make sure that they're facing one another properly. And you get this image sort of picture afterwards where you've got contrast flowing directly from the arterial system into the whole of the deep and superficial venous system. So they've done a couple of small studies in the US and Canada so far. The first study was a safety and feasibility study, showed very good technical success rates, um, very good six-month patency rates, um, and, a, and a time to maturation, which is sort of similar, if not perhaps slightly longer, than we see with surgically formed fistulas. The study they've just completed is a slightly larger efficacy study in the US in 60 patients. And again, very good technical success rates. Primary patency at six months of 86%, secondary patency of 88%. Couple of adverse events. They had one pseudoaneurysm related to the device deployment um, and a couple of brachial artery issues, which they think are related to the actual cannulation site and the use of purse strings um, to, to close the cannulation site, which they don't recommend. Looking at patency, these numbers are the sort of primary and secondary patency at 12 months. Now, they're not dramatically different to our, our numbers for brachiocephalic fistulas. But what you've got to remember, if, if you form a fistula endovascularly like this um, and it fails, you still have the option of a brachiocephalic fistula later. So you're essentially saving a vascular access option for these patients for later on if this is unsuccessful. <laughs> And looking at intervention rates, so they've taken the intervention rates from that study and compared them to a, to a matched retrospective Medicare cohort, and the intervention rates are reduced, um, so in terms of the endovascular intervention rates, but also the need for catheters and catheter-related morbidity, but also wound complications and infections are significantly reduced. So the number of interventions in total is significantly reduced in these patients, which has a potential cost saving. They on the basis of this retrospective data, so it has to be taken with a pinch of salt, reckon that this system is about $11,000 cheaper than forming a fistula surgically per patient during the first year. So what they're looking to do now is post-marketing studies in the US, in the, in the Europe, sorry. Um, so we're looking in Oxford to, to get involved in this, um, and they're setting up a, a European single-arm observational study of 200 patients um, to try and replicate these results in the European population. Again, looking at patency, procedure success, maturation time, adverse event rates, and with a cost analysis. Um, and uh, we met with them a couple of weeks ago, and we're hoping to recruit 20 patients in, in the UK, uh, in Oxford, by the end of the year. 
So just to summarize, I'm going to show you the complicated bits. This is the simple stuff, really, but there is room for improvement in native vascular access. Um, it remains the gold standard, but it is challenging creating and maintaining fistulas. And so we really do need these innovations to try and improve care for our patients. Being on dialysis is fairly miserable. Being in hospital for four hours, three days a week is bad enough. But if you add in all these additional interventions and morbidities for the patients, anything we can do to try and reduce the rate of intervention in this patient group is, is very important. Thank you.